This is Anna Adamek and I am in Kingston in Bath uh, interviewing David Lloyd, August 10th. So could you, could you tell me your name and where you were born? Oh, David Lloyd, yeah, I was uh, born uh, just at the end of the, the end of the war in 1943 in South Wales. Uh, my father was a, a miner, it was a Welsh mining valley. Father was a miner and uh, when I was born, but then he moved out of the mines into a factory. Uh, went to grammar school in, uh, uh, in South Wales. Uh, and uh, then went uh, from there to uh, University College Swansea, which uh, was part of the University of Wales. There were three or four campuses, Cardiff one, Swansea another one. So I went to Swansea. It was on the ocean, which was the main attraction. Um, and um, did metallurgy there, uh, did an honours degree in metallurgy, and uh, then after that did a PhD uh, also at Swansea. Um, worked uh, on uh, PhD project was on fatigue behavior of, uh, uh, of high purity iron. So just going back to your childhood a bit, um, mm. did your parents encourage you to be involved in science? Not particularly. They were working class uh, parents. Um, uh, they um, supported me in going to school, go to university, that was the driver because you didn't want to go down the mines and that was, in those days that was the option, uh, so um, uh, down the coal mines, so that wasn't uh, something that they wanted me to do, so they, they pushed me into education and so on. And at that time uh, you didn't need a lot of money, if you were Welsh you could go to uh, the University of Wales and you really didn't pay any fees. You paid you were living, but you didn't pay any, you didn't have any fees for courses or whatever. Um, so it was, uh, it was a good choice. And then nobody else in the family had been to university before me. Um, so uh, uh, they were uh, supportive and uh, so on. So it was, it was good. I, I enjoyed growing up and, in Wales and so on. Uh, and at uh, Swansea. Swansea is a relatively small university then. It's not now. I mean, I, I don't know how many students they have now. But in those days, uh, uh, it was a couple of thousand students, and the metallurgy department there was relatively small, but it was a, considered a very good one. Um, and uh, I got into metallurgy, I don't know, I, uh, I did at grammar school, I did maths, physics and chemistry. Uh, and it was always the solid state physics that I found interesting, crystals and so on. Uh, and it was a toss up really between going into geology or going into metallurgy. Both were attractive to me. Um, and, um, and the good thing about Swansea is that uh, uh, the metallurgy course was fairly flexible, so you could take things uh, in other departments, so they had a geology uh, option that you could take and they had some physics options, so it wasn't just all metallurgy and that was the attractive thing about it really. Uh, and in the end I decided the metallurgy was what uh, I was more interested in, in getting into. Uh, I, I thought that uh, at that time of course uh, there were plenty of jobs in the UK if you were uh, uh, in the physics or material science sort of area. Uh, not that material science was a term used in those days, but anyway. Uh, but there were, there were good labs there and so on. So there are plenty of opportunities for jobs in metallurgy. So I thought that was uh, something that I'd be interested in doing. So I sort of went and did. It was good, good fun. I enjoyed it all. Who are your professors? Oh, my main professor, well, my PhD was done uh, under uh, Professor Greenough. The department at Swansea was well known, had an excellent reputation for creep behavior uh, with um, uh, people like uh, um, Wilshire and so on were there. And they had a very strong orientation towards creep. But creep never really caught my attention uh, and uh, I decided that I would want to do something different and uh, Professor Greenough was a very interesting character uh, and he he was involved with uh, one of the r r railway companies and so on so I used to go with him and cast we would cast wheels up and various odds and bods when when I was an undergrad uh, and um, when it came to doing a a PhD. I thought about going to another university, but my parents sort of 
said, well, we'd like you to stay in Swansea, really. So um, uh, I decided that uh, uh, I wasn't really, uh, wasn't particularly interested in, at that time in creep. Um, and uh, Professor Greenough uh, was interested in fatigue. And there was some interesting work being done in fatigue at that time. It wasn't as well established as creep was. Uh, and he had... Uh, uh, an interest in whether you could mitigate some of the fatigue damage after it had happened, whether you could cure it essentially. So anyway, uh, so um, I did a thesis on uh, uh, on fatigue of uh, uh, high purity iron initially, and a little bit on uh, subsequently on on some steels, uh, and it was good fun. It was okay. Did you have any other memorable advisors, academic advisors? Not really, no. It was, uh, I mean, uh, you know, in those days I played soccer and cricket and whatever, and, and the, uh, the, the department was such that a lot of the profs played with us, really. So uh, George Wilshire played with us and, uh, and whatever. So, um, so it, but the, uh, it, was, it was mainly uh, green of, and... Um, you know, uh, PhDs are a little bit different in the UK relative to Canada. The profs, it's very much handoff. They they present the problem. Uh, they suggest way what sort of things you might look at in the literature, uh, and then that's that's it. And then you maybe every month or whatever you'd uh, sit down and chat with them uh, and see what disasters you propagated in that period of time and then uh, on you went really so it was fine and um, uh, the uh, my thesis was examined by uh, Dennis Hull Derek Hull Hull um, and um, that was it really it was, it was fine it was good fun very so, enjoyable so you completed your education in Ways. Yeah, and then in, why did you move to Canada? Well, I got interested as part of the fatigue work and whatever I was, uh, stuff that I was doing, I got interested in plasticity. And I remained interested in plasticity of, of metals ever since, really. Deformation, fracture behavior, and how microstructure influences things. And I had read uh, some papers that I that were very helpful in me understanding what was going on uh, by David Embry, uh, and he uh, um, uh, had come over to McMaster, and he was at at Mac, and I knew that Mac was a very good department in metallurgy at that at that time. It was a, a real powerhouse for its size, and um, it so happened that. Um, Dave had a, uh, uh, a postdoc available, uh, and so I wrote to him, talked to him about it, and he said, oh, why don't you come over? Uh, and we had uh, uh, we'd been married for about a, just over a year, uh, and my wife was keen, let's go and try it. Uh, and um, so the intention was to, uh, to come over for a couple of years in a postdoc and then go back. But we never got around to going back, basically, and uh, so um, I spent uh, a couple of years at Mac with uh, uh, Dave Embry, and he had some super students, and the department was really top-notch, really bright people and interesting people, uh, and um, it was it was really good. Um, uh, so I spent a couple of years there, uh, and then when the postdoc came to an end. Um, I uh, uh, thought, well, what shall I do? Shall I stay in academia or shall I do something else? And um, we hadn't seen the West. And um, uh, Chris Tangri at the University of Manitoba um, had a research associate position available. Now, the materials department in the University of Manitoba was part of mechanical engineering. Uh, and there were basically three props in the in the materials department and um, uh, talking to Chris he said well we, we come and uh, spend a bit of time I got we've got the, the group we have money for a research associate for a few years why didn't you come uh, and that's what I did and uh, um, went to Manitoba uh, worked with uh, particularly with uh, Chris Tangri and Mahesh Chattavedi, two really excellent scientists, really 
interesting stuff and they were doing very different stuff. Chris was in, interested in uh, uh, basically the fundamental behavior of grain boundaries and what, how grains influence things in terms of deformation. Uh, and that sort of initiated an interest in grain boundaries that I've had ever since, essentially. Uh, and um, uh, Mahesh was more interested in uh, super alloys and uh, uh, hexagonal close pack systems of magnesium. Uh, and he and I did uh, uh, work together as well. Uh, and um, it, was, it was good fun. It's a, it's a nice small department mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of interaction with students and graduate students. Uh, how, how did you find the difference between uh, academia in Wales and academia in Canada? No, there wasn't. At that time there was really same culture. No, no difference. It was, the cultures mm -hmm. were essentially the same. Uh, and uh, certainly, in, at least in physical metallurgy anyway. Um, so um, there wasn't really any major difference that struck me uh, in it. And, uh, uh, yeah, there were talented people around, and it, it uh, between Mac and Manitoba, that gave me an opportunity to interact with people at other universities, meet people at other universities, and uh, and companies, and and so on. Really, uh, who, who do you so consider as a mentor? Oh well, at that stage, I had three mentors, and the three people I mentioned: Dave Embry, Chris Tangri, and Mahash Ch Chaturvedi. I learned an enormous amount from those, I guess. Uh, and that probably dictated my approach to, to, to science from that time on. Um, they, you know, they, they, were, they taught me how to approach problems, how to think about problems, uh, and um, uh, the, the essence of trying to understand a problem to a stage that you can actually predict and quantify what's going to happen. Uh, and um, that sort of approach I've used ever since really. <laughs> I mean, I, that's how I approach science essentially. Uh, and um, uh, they were, three of them were really incredibly influential to me. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, they were really significant in terms of at that, in, uh, in early, in my early period, really, those are the three people that had an enormous influence on me. And do you have uh, colleagues that you work well with, especially? I've never had any difficulty working with anybody, to be honest. Um, but I have to admit, I, I only work, uh, and I was, I've been fortunate enough to be always in a position where I've been able to work on things that interest me. Uh, and provided it interests me, um, I've um, uh, I've never had any difficulty working with with, with people at all. Um, but I, as I say, I've been fortunate in that uh, uh, I've never really worked in anything that didn't interest me. I could always, I've always been able to avoid doing <laughs> doing that, which is rather lucky. <laughs> Very lucky. lucky. Uh, so you know, I and. Uh, uh, but um, uh, and uh, interacting with with people, you know, science is is really the majority of science advancement is incremental steps, and every now and again there's a there's a quantum leap, a significant change, and it, that may be due to a process, or it may be due to uh, the uh, uh, somebody uh, getting an understanding that just wasn't there before, um, uh, and for that you, it's science of root is always a group exercise, really, uh, and it may not be necessarily somebody that in your department or that you're working with, but but uh, um, the the it's largely a a group activity, really, and I've been fortunate to work with over particularly uh, through Al through my career, career at Alcan, uh, with a lot of uh, bright young people and so on, and still have contact with a lot of them and mm -hmm. still do science with, with some of them. So it's, uh, uh, I've been very fortunate, I think. You know, we, we <sighs> life tends to influence you when you, have an influence on you in terms of when you're born, right? Mm -hmm. and. 
I I was born essentially uh, at the end of the war, so that didn't have any influence on me. Uh, and then we went through that long period when when uh, uh, universities were expanding, industry was expanding, the economy was so it was it was a golden age, and it, at least from my perspective, anyway. Um, and um, it, it uh, if you're fortunate enough to be able to take advantage of that, and I was, um, that's that's really good. Today, uh, well, that's a different story. <laughs> we'll get but to anyway, that. Yeah, yeah. You, you chose to do your research in an industrial setting. So why did you well, leave academia? That's around? yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I had I had done my PhD at university, been at Mac at university, uh, and then at University of Manitoba. So I I basically done nothing other than at university, and uh, I had a gut feel that maybe doing something different at this, you know, I was what in my late, you know, what I was, late 20s I suppose. Uh, I thought, well, maybe uh, doing something different might be good. And, and uh, I, particularly with, uh, uh, with at Manitoba, uh, with Mahesh uh, Chattavedi, we did some work on super alloys, and these were real materials that they were actually being used. Uh, and I realized how complicated real materials were. Uh, so that attracted me towards real materials. But in addition to that, I, I decided that while I'm a, a reasonably good metallurgist, uh, I wasn't really interested in what I call dotting the I's and crossing the T's. The detail really sometimes, sometimes you need to know the detail, but in general, um, I, I was more interested in the broader issue and if I understood a problem to a level that I could make use of the understanding and quantify what the issues were, that was as far as I was interested in going. I wasn't interested in or capable of really looking at things at an ultra level of detail really. Uh, so I, I suppose I was a bit of a generalist. And I thought that uh, uh, academia really should be reserved for those who can really make the step functions, not the incremental functions. And that was my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that uh, uh, going into industry would be an interesting thing to do for a change as well. So I thought about going back to the UK uh, and uh, again at that time jobs were not difficult to get. So um, uh, I, I had job offers in the UK, from the US, uh, and um, uh, in Canada uh, I knew a couple of people at the Alcan lab uh, in Kingston, uh, Larry Morris particularly and a couple of others, uh, and um, I think it was Larry suggested, why don't you come in and give a talk? I think I was a I was giving a talk at the CIM in Montreal or Quebec City or somewhere, and he says, "Well, it's on your way back. When you come in, give us, you know, have a chat." So I came in, uh, and I only then realised that um, the Kingston Lab, the managers of the Kingston Lab, had decided to broaden the perspective of the Kingston Lab. Um, Alcan at that time had two physical metallurgy labs, uh, one in Banbury and one in Kingston. And the Banbury lab was more fundamentally oriented. They did very fundamental stuff, very good stuff, I mean, excellent, superb lab, very fundamental stuff, whereas the Kingston lab was more application engineering oriented. Uh, and the management uh, um, uh, at the Kingston Lab had decided that they wanted to uh, look at some other uh, aspects of aluminum metallurgy rather than just the straight uh, application side and they asked me would I be interested in uh, coming. And at that time they brought in uh, some, uh, a, a few other people um, to basically form a separate group uh, and it, it was nominally a group that did core 
science, as it was called. You know, there, were, there was uh, the, the orientation of the lab uh, was essentially technical assistance and applications. Uh, and they wanted to broaden it to uh, uh, have more fundamental work done. Not that there wasn't, there was uh, a couple of people doing, I thought, fairly fundamental work, particularly in, in the extrusion area and so on. But anyway, they wanted to broaden it and uh, 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 John Wilson and uh, uh, Jeff Torrible said, well, why don't you come and uh, uh, think about some new materials? What you know, what sort of new materials could Alcan get interested in? And I think sometime around then, uh, um, the uh, David Calvo, who was CEO of, of Alcan, had decided that uh, Alcan needed to diversify its portfolio. Alcan traditionally is basically a smelter company, uh, and anything that he was doing was a means of moving metal out of the smelter and sell it really. Uh, and um, uh, he decided that um, we sh they should, the, the company should have some research going on into, to enable it to, to diversify. Uh, and um, uh, uh, he brought in uh, as chief technical officer, uh, Hewin Edwards, uh, who was dean at UBC, I think, and also was at Queens. Anyway, uh, he he took he took over that portfolio, uh, and essentially had, I guess, the mandate to broaden uh, Alcan from being uh, on the fabrication end, being a, a foil and can company, which he could sell thousands of tons of metal to, to doing something in where would he go after the can well because it's never gone anywhere after the can the can is still there and foil is still there but anyway uh but that was the, the mandate so um uh we looked at well looked at a whole range of different sorts of things and got involved in a whole bunch of different things at a uh at a fairly fundamental level i suppose to understand how various things worked what you know, it, it stretched from, uh, oh, well, I don't know, one end optimizing the alloy for uh, uh, the powder that went into the solid propellants on the shuttle mm -hmm. uh, to automotive alloys and uh, metal matrix composites and various stuff. Do you, you know. remember your first day at Alcan? Sorry? Do you remember your first day at Alcan? No, that's too long that's ago. I don't remember my first day at Alcan. Uh, nothing sticks in my mind about that. That's, oh Lord, I don't know, that's <laughs> 60 years ago. Uh, I don't think, well, I'm not quite 60, but 50 anyway. <laughs> so, uh, how did you find the production side cooperation between research at Alcan and production side at Alcan? Well, they're two different cultures, right? Um, and um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, production side uh, doesn't want to do anything new if it can avoid it, and that's understandable. Uh, they're doing well, they're making money, whatever, and now you're asking them to do something new, you know, bring in a new material, change their process. Uh, but uh, the, the knowledge bit, Alcan was very lucky, uh, in my view anyway. It generally had very, very good people on the, on the, on the production floor. So, um, Really, before you thought about introducing anything new, technology or whatever, um, it was very wise to go and chat to the people on the floor and they would tell you all the reasons why they really didn't want to do it uh, and why and so on. And you learned from that uh, and then you could make a decision in terms of what made sense from their perspective. And, you know, introducing a new technology to a production operation, it's a full body contact sport. There's no two ways about it. Uh, because you were trying to uh, get them to do something new, to take a risk and so on. Uh, and you can understand why, that, why they're reluctant to, to do that. But if you could make a convincing argument uh, and you showed how it would help them and uh, uh, could be twisted and tweaked so that it really didn't cause too much of a problem, 
and that was good. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the people on the plant floor uh, at Root knew far more uh, about what the hell the material was all about uh, and what the issues were than anybody else did uh, because they were hands-on day in, day out. Um, so, you know, that, uh, so you had to work at that and, and there were, you inevitably uh, identified particular individuals in the various operations worldwide um, that were worth talking to and learning from and um, uh, if you made, the, made that sort of effort um, then um, it was it was okay, but it it was it was an element that you had to work at really, um, and uh, I think in in many ways, from my perspective, since I was interested in the science and the technology, uh, not the business end of it, um, it was a, uh, it was an interesting interchange really. And um, you know, I, I, did you work in English or in English and French? No English. English uh, and. There was no uh, you see, the 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 the, um, uh, the, um, the smelter operation was pretty well all French, uh, but in fact, uh, my tortuous French and their tortuous English enabled us to get on. Uh, you know, I remember being uh, uh, in Alvader on the plant floor and Castor one day, and I needed to twist a nut. And uh, what the heck is the French for a spanner? And uh, uh, I was indicating what I was needing, and uh, uh, a colleague from Avida said, "Ah, a wrench." <laughs> 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 yeah, but uh, no, it's it, uh, uh, you know my French is very rudimentary, really. Uh, but uh, it didn't cause it any didn't problems. cause. I I never had a issue with that really and, uh, uh, but as a, I didn't spend a lot of time in Quebec anyway really um, because you know that was predominantly smelter it was only they had uh, the belt caster a belt caster up there and later much later on they put a metal matrix composite plant into there and those are the really the only two areas that uh, uh, resulted in me spending any time on the, on the plants. You worked in different operations around the world, I believe, for Alcan. So could you tell me where you work and talk a bit about well, different research cultures? Well, one of the things that, that um, the Kingston management group decided to do um, was try to interface the two, the Kingston and the Banbury labs initially. Um, because we realized that um, we were pretty thin on the ground technically uh, uh, with research scientists and so on relative to the Alcoas of this world and the Passionet and whatever. Uh, so one of the things that we, the lab decided to do was try to integrate the programs between the uh, the Kingston lab and the Banbury lab. Uh, and that was interesting. Um, and for, to do that, um, they asked me to go to the Banbury lab uh, for a year. Uh, and eventually I spent a bit longer than that there, but roughly a, a, a year. And that was uh, uh, an interesting experience because, uh, as I said, the, the uh, the culture of the two labs was a little bit different in that we were, even when we were doing new alloy development or whatever, it was it was strongly oriented towards a product, a particular product or application that we had in mind. Uh, whereas um, some elements, not all, but some elements of the Banbury lab were essentially uh, almost a university sort of approach. Uh, so it was a rather different sort of culture. Uh, and when I went over there, um, Alcan had, uh, uh, had just taken over British aluminum. And um, one of the big projects was aluminum lithium alloys for aerospace. Uh, Banbury did a lot of aerospace work, aerospace research. We didn't in Kingston, we weren't in, Alcan in, in Canada was not in the aerospace business. Uh, so, um, uh, the aluminum lithium uh, activity uh, was was a 
a strong uh, uh, project, a, a fairly large project at, uh, at that time. So um, I got involved in, uh, in that and a couple of other projects um, that uh, I was interested in as well. Uh, and we were over there for uh, a year or so. Uh, and, that, and that subsequently set a, a model then for, for people doing interchanges and we worked out I was the guinea pig, I guess. I went first. Uh, but we worked out then uh, what sort of uh, interchanges were relevant, what sort of people we would bring across to Kingston and other people we, we would move to, to Banbury. Uh, and, uh, and that resulted eventually uh, towards the end of, of a period of, uh, of, of Alcan, the programs, there were joint programs between the two laboratories. I mean, uh, people in Banbury had responsibility for research and program development programs over here. I had responsibility for, for stuff going on in, in, in Banbury at the technical level, not at a management level, but at a technical level. Uh, and um, we, we succeeded in bringing the two laboratories uh, a lot closer together. Uh, and I did a short stint as a, as a research director and uh, with a research director in the Banbury lab at that time, we essentially totally combined the core programs between the two laboratories and, I, uh, and that was very good. And then they shut the Banbury lab, but uh, <laughs> we won't go into that one. <laughs> Well, I'd like to hear about that. Well, I mean, it's a management decision, I guess, money or whatever. We, we had, we, uh, we had essentially, uh, the, after British Alcan, we then uh, invest, bought Ali Swiss. Supposed to be a merger, but it wasn't that. We bought Ali Swiss. Uh, and Ali Swiss had this uh, lab uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and um, it, was, it was a really nice lab, a uh, nice place, uh, close to the German border. Uh, and, Do you uh, remember which town? Jeez, Neuhausen, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, it uh, it was it was a different culture again, really. Uh, and so we then had to try and integrate programs between. Uh, Banbury, Kingston, and uh, uh, no, Shafthausen. Shaft that's what Neu I thought. Neuhausen I was in Shafthausen a few years ago. Yeah. Jeez, memory. Anyway, um, uh, we had to try and integrate those programs. And I guess they decided that that wasn't going too well, or the, they, they, the management. Uh, and in their wisdom, they decided to close Banbury Lab. Uh, rather than Schaffhausen. I guess they wanted to, uh, to be on main, in mainland Europe or whatever. Uh, and anyway, uh, so they did that and they closed the Banbury lab. Uh, and they transferred uh, quite a few of the people. Uh, they identified people, or yeah, they identified people who they felt would benefit from going to Schaffhausen or Schaffhausen, Alcan, Swiss would benefit from them. Uh, so those people were identified and they were transferred uh, to Schaffhausen. Uh, and um, uh, the rest of the people were all, well, they were paid off and went into uh, uh, a private consulting company called Innoval, um, which actually did very, survived and did very well. I mean, not called Innoval today, maybe not, I don't know, but, but it's, it's done very well. Uh, but as a result of that, of course, whenever you close a lab, um, you suffer from the fact that you lose people. Uh, and when you lose people, in addition to losing the people, you actually lose the knowledge base that those people have, and you never recover from it. It, it just does not happen. Uh, the historical knowledge base is gone and the people say, oh, we got the reports and so on. Yeah, well, nobody reads it. So, uh, so you lose that knowledge base. And um, uh, I think uh, certainly R&D in Europe, from Alcan's perspective, uh, really declined drastically, uh, in my view.
<laughs> That's uh, from insightful. that time on. Uh, and of course, subsequently, we had a similar thing happen in, in, uh, in Canada. But anyway, um, so, um, so I did that. I spent, uh, so that on a permanent basis or permanent, semi-permanent basis, it, uh, uh, there was a Banbury stint. Then I did smaller stints really in response to specific program needs. So um, uh, we, uh, um, we had programs in, uh, in uh, Nippon Light Metals uh, and uh, uh, what was the other one? Oh dear, a foil company uh, in uh, Japan that Alcan owned at that time. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Toyel aluminum it was called and Toyel was involved in powders and they wanted to increase aluminum powders which are a really tricky thing you've got to be very careful with aluminum powders anyway we had a very good technology atomization technology and uh, so on and um, we decided to put the company decided to put uh, an atomizer uh, into the Toyel operation which was just outside of Osaka uh, so uh, at that time I was I had been doing a lot of work on on aluminum powders primarily associated with the, the space program and so on for the solid propellants uh, and um, uh, so I went there uh, 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 back and forth to Japan for a year or so pretty regularly when we were putting and uh, commissioning that operation uh, and then I spent some time while well, in the Swiss operation uh, and uh, uh, some time um, uh, with a German operation with uh, uh, product, uh, automotive products and so on through, through the mm -hmm. German operation. Um, so, yeah. Very interesting. Well, yeah, no, yeah, uh, but, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, time in the States. Uh, to the plants in the States. I mean, Alcan was big at that time mm -hmm. uh, and had a lot of its fingers in a lot of uh, uh, operations and so on. So it was, an inter it, was, it was an interesting company to be in, provided you didn't mind a lot of traveling. Mind you, traveling was a lot easier in that day. You didn't have to be at the airport three hours before for an hour flight. So, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that onerous. And, and Alcan looked at you very well. So I, you, you were never, you weren't in uh, super eight motels or whatever. They always, they appreciated that mm -hmm. if you were traveling and you were away over a weekend, blah, 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 they, they would look after you. And they were very good. Uh, it, was, it was a super company to work for really at that uh, at that time. Yeah. So, you know, the, it, the company, it's always interesting when you spend time in in uh, overseas operations because the cultures are often very different uh, and you know in Japan uh, in the labs and whatever uh, the boss was there and nobody left until the boss leave even if you weren't doing anything useful you still stayed there uh, so that was a, a different sort of uh, approach and, and you know it's uh, uh, so not always there are the cultural differences when you so it's always interesting but people were uh, I always found I think most of us found people the company the culture of the company was one of of friendship and cooperation and um, uh, I mean obviously there's politics in any yes. company or any flipping bureaucracy or organization but um, at, at base level it, 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 uh, people were always very friendly very helpful and would go out of their way to help you and so on and uh, particularly in Japan was always a tad of a problem because they always wanted to entertain you because they you know they felt that you couldn't survive on your own in Japan mind you in those days it's a lot different than now in, in you know in, in Japan in those days you had to be very careful where uh, there wasn't much English so that we had some key signs that that indicated to us where the washroom was, where the exit was, and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but they always wanted to entertain you, and and that after you've spent a day doing technical stuff, uh, and the only you want to do is put your head down, um, you really couldn't do that. It, it, you know, the, the people in the plant or uh, in the lab, uh, it, it was a. Uh, 
uh, a sort of thing for them to a perk for them to uh, uh, to be entertained or to take you out to entertain you. So um, it uh, it was pretty arduous in those days, but now it's a lot it's a lot better. But uh, uh, I wanted to talk to you about your patents. Uh, you have a number of patents, so mm -hmm. can you talk a bit about your innovations? Well, you know, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, I, I worked on such a very broad range of things. So mm -hmm. I have patterns, I guess, from powders to aerospace alloys to automotive alloys to uh, um, to metal matrix composites uh, to twin roll casting. They're just things that come out of the work and. You know, you, 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 you. We always, uh, when we reviewed a project, uh, um, what we had done, we always decided then: were we going to patent it, or were we going to publish it, or were we going to keep quiet about it? Uh, and we had very good patent department that gave input on uh, on that, uh, and um, it wasn't a decision that I made. It was. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd say to the patent people, well, do you think this is patentable? Do, is it something we want to patent? Or what do we want to do with it? Do we want to publish it? Or do we just want to report it and keep it under wraps in the company? And that's what we did, really. And, um, you know, they, they came around. Of course, a lot of these patents are done for, uh, are done for business reasons as well. Uh, and that's why it was important to involve the patent and, and the business people on these things because uh, you know you might decide to uh, put a hedge around the technology really and one way of doing that is to patent stuff that really you're doing it from you're not trying to make money on the patent you're doing it to protect a root patent or something in something in the technology uh, so there are a lot of, of, of different reasons for, for patenting something uh, and uh, uh, you know you had priorities a US patent was the key uh, patent that you wanted um, and then uh, a European patent and then a world patent really and those were the, the, the major routes of the patents that they would go through um, so uh, um, it, it was it, it wasn't uh, uh, something that that you particularly got any brownie points from. You didn't own the patent, the company owned the patent. Well, you got a silver, you used to, with our kind, you used to get a silver dollar for the patents. And that was good, because uh, uh, usually uh, there were technologists that had uh, uh, contributed just as much as anybody else on these things, and they never got on the patent. So I, we used to give the silver dollars to the, uh, in a nice little uh, uh, container, sort of box uh, to the technologists and so on because they deserved it as much as anybody else so, and that was good it was fine. but I never really thought about uh, I, I never really thought about um, about patents or uh, uh, or really innovation actually I mean, um, usually with 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 a project it may be a new material so uh, that you thought maybe Alcan, some part of business in Alcan could take advantage of. Uh, and that's how we got into uh, uh, really the powder mat area. Um, really my interest in the powders was nothing to do with explosives and nasty aluminum powder that blows up at a drop of a hat. Uh, but it was really the fact that, that uh, uh, when you produce an aluminum powder, it was rapidly solidified. Mm -hmm. And the metallurgy of that was interesting. Uh, and how you stabilize the powder so that it, did, so that it only blew up when you wanted it to blow up was interesting sort of problem. And that's how I got into aluminum powders, not uh, powder metallurgy. You know, the atomic number for aluminum is 13. 13 is an unlucky <laughs> number. And while aluminum, in many respects, is an amazing material with its alloys, it's just incredible. You know? I mean, when you can have strengths from uh, 50 MPA to over 700 MPA, depending on what you've done with the alloy, it's an incredible range of strengths. But it has major 
limitations as well. Uh, room temperature is a pretty high fraction of the homologous temperature for, uh, for aluminum. So thermal stability is not a, not a big thing with aluminum. It's a big issue. Uh, and we've spent, I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at ways of, of improving the thermal stability of, of, of aluminum alloys. Uh, so it, 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 uh, it has a lot of drawbacks in, in, way, in many ways, but, uh, but you, know, you, you can do a lot with it. It's pretty amazing, really, what you can do. And it, it's carrying on all the time, so it's, it's still interesting material. Still a lot of things about aluminum alloys that I'm particularly ignorant about. But anyway. <laughs> What was the most difficult project that you worked on? Or something you would identify as a failure? A failure? Um, well, I don't think there were many activities that we carried on, that research and so on, that we carried on that were technical failures. There were a heck of a lot of failures for business reasons and whatever. Um, but um, there were uh, cases where, where research was, was, after we'd spent a lot of time and effort on research, uh, the results were disappointing. Uh, but they were mainly, be, in my view, <laughs> from business decisions. And they might be perfectly valid business decisions. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I don't know, know anything about the business side of things. Um, but we spent a large amount of time and effort on continuous casting because some of us, Larry Morris particularly, who is a very close mentor of mine and friend of mine, no longer with us unfortunately, uh, in the Kingston lab, he and I and a few others believed that continuous casting at the end of the day was, was where a lot of the of aluminum was going to be produced. And there were two uh, casting technologies within the corporation. There was the belt caster, which was uh, a thick, it cast a slab continuously, and it was, it was thick, uh, and it went, it went fast, so the tonnage was very high. Uh, and then there was another casting technology, which was a twin roll casting technology, uh, which was thin and very slow. And the difference between the two was that the heat flux in the belt caster was low, whereas the heat flux in the twin roll caster was very high. And that, from a metallurgical point of view, was a huge, makes a huge difference to the microstructure and so on. And Larry and I and a group of other people in the lab felt that the twin roll caster was really, at the end of the day, uh, was where uh, the major metallurgical advantages were, whereas the belt caster uh, was a large tonnage caster, uh, but it produced, let's say, metallurgically uninteresting material. Uh, it was fine and is fine for, for foil and so on, but the technology at that time, uh, Larry used to say it, it was an engineering technology. Engineers ran the program, you know. Uh, so we, ha we, we spent some time uh, understanding primarily the twin roll caster and developed solidification models and so on. And Alcan uh, had, I think, uh, a knowledge of twin roll casting. It was second to none. Uh, we understood what alloys you could and could not cast, what made sense metallurgically. Uh, and we did a lot of work with uh, um, University of, uh, uh, of Oxford, the solidification group at Oxford and so on, on twin roll casters. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, we could do things that nobody else could do. Uh, we could cast magnesium, a lot of stuff now in the, in the literature of casting magnesium alloys. We had a small magnesium twin roll caster operating. At that time, we owned magnesium electron. Uh, and we had a small twin roll caster producing magnesium alloys 
30 years ago, probably earlier than that. Uh, now, it was never published, it was never spoken about or whatever, but we could cast magnesium, uh, the traditional magnesium alloys on a twin roll caster, no problem. Well, there's always problems, but I mean, you know, you could cast it. Uh, the twin roll casting technology was, was um, uh, our knowledge base was extremely good. And then Alcan, in his wisdom, decided to get rid of his twin roll casters. I mean, uh, a grave error. Uh, but we also made an error. But we being the scientists, people like Larry and myself, we, the, we should have concentrated more on trying to improve uh, the heat flux on a belt caster. Al can like the belt caster because he was hundreds of pounds coming out of the caster, a drop of a heart, great, and so they put it next to the smelter, and it was an okay caster. It just, metallurgically, it didn't produce anything particularly exciting. Uh, or, you, well, not useful, it did. I mean, we, we produced a, a foil material off it and routine alloys and so on. And that was good, that was fine. But from a metallurgical point of view, from our interests uh, of doing something new and different, he couldn't do it. And it was only actually when uh, uh, when I had essentially retired, uh, that um, uh, the group in Kingston, uh, Mark Galno and the group in Kingston, uh, Novellis at that time, um, developed what's called the flex caster, which is a belt caster, but it casts thin, five to ten millimeters thick, and its heat flux is, is very high. Um, we did not do that. We did not look at the potential of doing that at the time. Uh, uh, probably because, well, we probably thought the engineers wouldn't want us to go thin, the smelter people wouldn't want us to go thin. Uh, but that, the, the flex caster um, really uh, is a significant advance, but that was only done much later on. And, and now Alcan or Novellis then decided that he wanted to get out of continuous casting. Uh, so, and uh, there's no continuous casting mm -hmm. uh, in the Novellis operation at the moment. Now the flex caster though uh, is in Japan. Uh, the technology was licensed or whatever to uh, Nippon Light Metals in Japan and they have a flex caster over there uh, casting a variety of alloys including some of the 5000 Almag alloys. So that's an interesting development and is metallurgically interesting because uh, the microstructural issues now are very different than they were on the on the thick slab casters but <coughs> so that so that was <coughs> uh, when they when they got rid of the twin roll casters and so on uh, that was a, mm -hmm. a disappointment I think because we'd spend a lot of time and effort uh, and we understood it so well um, and could take advantage of it really and uh, it was a shame but they were. Well. And what is your fondest memory? Oh, I enjoyed the whole period there. But I, I think the, the uh, in fact a friend a couple of weeks ago, uh, who's also retired, uh, was saying, geez, you know, those, those years in, in uh, uh, in Kingston, because uh, he was in Kingston as well at that time. Uh, you know, it was pretty fun time. And it, and if if you were a, a scientist, it, you know, when you're interested in science, it really was. Uh, we had we had, you know, we had flexibility. We we could do, you know, provided you could make a case that you were doing something that could have relevance to the to the to the company, uh, to the corporation. Um, you could you could get enough money to demonstrate a principle or whatever, uh, and uh, so that, so it was a great period. But I, I think, uh, uh, and he was saying to me, well, you know, what way? I don't think he, he put it as what was your fondest memory, but uh, but he said he said you know what did you enjoy most about being there in addition to the science. And we were fortunate enough, uh, well, when I was a principal scientist, I had a budget I could 
pretty well do whatever I wanted to do with it, provided I could justify it at the end of the year. Uh, but we initiated uh, bringing in people from uh, uh, graduate students and so on, uh, IESTA students from overseas, and uh, we brought in uh, and supported uh, uh, a lot of, of really bright young young people, and often we then subsequently hired them. It was really one of our main hiring routes, you know. Uh, but it gave us a, a, a route into the unit with the people in the in the various universities and so on. Uh, and often uh, we'd uh, uh, support their PhD. We didn't really take anybody below PhD level at that time. Uh, odd ma the odd masters, but most of the time it was a PhD student, and we often supported the program because it was it was incredible value for money. You know, a PhD student I don't know what it is today, but it, for me it was incredibly cheap to support a PhD student, double the value of the PhD student uh, as as research money for their project at university, and it gave you. Uh, input in, into the program, into the universities, uh, and the return was incredible. I mean, it was far from a purely money point of view. Uh, I mean, it was far cheaper than bringing in somebody new, untrained, or whatever. And we developed close contacts with them. Uh, and I think the, the, um, the good thing it looking back is how many of these people I still have contact with a lot of them uh, who have gone on and they're now people like uh, uh, Dr. Mary Wells at, at uh, Waterloo and uh, uh, various other people all over who really know profs at universities and so on we still have still have contact with them and, and so on. So I think that to me anyway that was a major both doing the science was great but interacting with uh, the, the university people. And we interacted, well, our, the materials group interacted with uh, uh, a lot of universities. I mean, uh, and it was all, very, I, I can't remember, I mean, some project didn't work out, but you always learned something, even if the project didn't work out. But we, uh, we had programs, uh, uh, stuff going on at Dalhousie, UBC, Mac, Toronto, uh, uh, overseas in Australia. We had I had programs going on there, uh, programs in the UK, uh, and tying in with the Banbury Lab was good because then we could take advantage. Uh, they had these European, large European scientific programs, and again for dollar wise next to nothing. Mm -hmm. um, we could uh, get involved, we could set up a project between Banbury Kingston and then put a program activity together as part of the European program. And um, they were incredible, you know, I mean, uh, we had activities at Oxford, Cambridge, Manchester and so on. And uh, I, I, I guess probably, well, probably over a third of, of uh, the the group's budget was actually with university staff, uh, universities worldwide. Really, did some work with uh, uh, the university at, in Sendai in Japan, MIT. We did uh, uh, did some powder work with uh, with MIT people, and uh, also some casting work with the MIT people. So it was it was, it was great, you know. And uh, you mentioned Dr. Wells. Uh, Mm -hmm. Did you? Do you mention Dr. Mary Wells? Mm -hmm. Did you work with other women? Oh yes, oh yes. I we it, it was if the individuals were talented, uh, that was what we were looking for. And, and uh, I worked well we, uh, with Mary uh, and also with uh, uh, Shazad Ismaili, in, uh, who's now also at uh, Waterloo, uh, and. Uh, 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 quite a few uh, uh, female undergrads and uh, uh, graduate students and so on. So, yeah. So, I, uh, but there was we we had we always had a well. It, really, there was we never really thought about. Uh, I don't think any of us really thought about women or non-women. Really, I mean, you were a scientist. They did 
whatever. If you're a good scientist, great. If you're a poor scientist, didn't make any difference whether you're a man or a woman, we weren't interested. That's the way it goes. But uh, yeah, no, we we uh, that that was never uh, never issue. an issue at all in the lab. Uh, Novalis took over the lab in 2005 and then closed it down in 2013. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, I was fortunate in that really uh, I got, you know, I got sick in, in 2000 uh, and they gave me five years to live. Uh, so I thought, well, yeah, we have to uh, uh, make some adjustments here. Uh, and when after the after the initial treatment, I only went back to work for, for a couple of years, and Novellis had then, uh, it had been taken over, uh, uh, it had taken over the lab. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I didn't really see much for me to do. I didn't really, health-wise, I really couldn't function as I had anyway, so it wasn't that big. But, uh, but I didn't uh, uh, really see much synergy with the things, the culture or the, the things that um, I was interested in. Although um, one area uh, that I did quite a bit of work on was uh, uh, one of the people, one of the people, oh, there was a tie up with Wagstaff casting operation and Bob Wagstaff who's an incredibly innovative guy had come up with this technology of being able to directly cast a clad product. Now clad products and aluminum are really very important uh, with a range of applications uh, but they were always cladding is is it was always difficult. Aluminum has this oxide skin, it really doesn't like to, it doesn't like anything else. Uh, and Bob had come up with this technology of, of, of making a clad ingot on a DC caster. Incredibly clever technology, really. Uh, and um, I was interested in it for, now, Bob's interest in it was for brazing sheet. Uh, and that's Great. My interest was not in brazing sheet at all. Uh, my interest was whether you could uh, influence the plasticity of a material by pla cladding it, and how could you do that? How thick would the cladding be? What would the alloys be, and so on? So we uh, uh, we had a uh, 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 a small project with Bob because Bob would cast anything. You tell him, "Oh, I want that cast." Oh, yeah, we'll cast it. Uh, so. Um, uh, we uh, uh, had a small project uh, to understand clad materials. What level of cladding did you have to have for a particular application? What would it do, do? And I was particularly interested, again, uh, my orientation is plasticity issues, uh, and I was particularly interested in improving the apparent bendability of aluminum sheet. Aluminum uh, sheet has issues with its bendability. And we had had a project before I got sick on understanding bendability. And I think now we understand it pretty well. We understand what's going on, what the issues are, and whatever. Uh, uh, but um, I was interested in if we clad the material, um, would that influence the bendability? Because I, I said to Bobby, would have a huge influence on the bendability, and other people say, ah, forget it, you won't influence the bendability. Well, it does have a huge influence on the apparent bendability. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, um, I, I did work on that project pretty extensively, because that was something that I could do without traveling or whatever. Uh, and then in, uh, oh, I don't, I don't know what, you know, well, I retired in 2000, officially retired in 2005, but I hadn't been doing, uh, <laughs> hadn't really been doing much for uh, a couple of years before that. But, uh, uh, but anyway, I officially retired in 2005. Then, uh, and so Novellis came in, and um, uh, initially there was not significant change, I don't think, uh, in the company really, um, because it was. Um, it was a far, it, it, what Novellis was, it was 
essentially the fabrication arm of Alcan. So Alcan started as a smelter company. Then it moved through the war periods and so on uh, to a uh, uh, to be more and more fabricationally oriented. So we had rolling mills, extrusion plants, and so on. Uh, and David Culver then came in to try and diversify from the can and the foil to other products. Uh, and uh, then uh, Nobelis uh, essentially was essentially what was the fabrication arm of Alcan and was sheared off. So Alcan went back to <laughs> being a smelter company in essence, uh, I suppose. Uh, and then uh, um, so initially, uh, Novellis was the uh, fabrication, what had been the fabrication arm of, of, uh, uh, of uh, Alcan. Uh, and then um, Novellis was sold off to an Indian company. Uh, and um, it, uh, uh, it then was essentially, essentially got out of continuous casting, got out of, well, it already got out of extrusion and so on, whatever, uh, and was concentrating on sheet products, really, and uh, which is fine, I guess, from a business perspective. And, uh, but it, um, it, it uh, really um, didn't have the same, at least it appeared to me that it didn't have the same approach to R and D and so on that, that Alcan had and whatever, but you know, by that time I wasn't well and mm -hmm. maybe it was just me rather than It wasn't company. your priority. <laughs> but then uh, uh, it was then the management after the Indian group took over, the management went to um, the Americans uh, in the States and um, they decided that uh, uh, they wanted to move the R&D center to the US. Now it's interesting, uh, many years before when uh, um, when Alcan was looking at R&D and what it cost and whatever, whatever, um, we looked at where was the most economical place to do R&D uh, and should it be in Kingston, should it be in Banbury, uh, or should it be somewhere in the States? And we had a small lab outside of Chicago, which was a lab in Canning and so on. Uh, so we looked at all of that and uh, as scientists and uh, a bunch of financial people and so on. And it was a no-brainer. Uh, Alcan really was getting a big chunk of his R&D free. It was a tax-free break uh, and cost-wise, it made no sense to, to move it from it, because we were looking at would we close Kingston Lab, or somebody was looking at would we close Kingston Lab, or would we close the Banbury Lab, or would we keep them both going, whatever, whatever. And we looked at the costs. Banbury was more expensive than, than Kingston. Um, but, you know, and, uh, but if you looked elsewhere, I mean, the States made no sense to us. And I knew that because whenever I had uh, projects at American universities, it always cost me more than double what I was paying either in Europe or Canada. But anyway, so uh, we had decided that we weren't going to um, uh, close at that time either the Banbury or the Kingston lab. We were going to keep both of them open uh, because both labs got big tax breaks and so on and you know, whatever. Uh, so, uh, but Novellis in its wisdom decided uh, to close the Kingston lab and of course they felt uh, that uh, the people would rush to go to Atlanta. Well, Canadians are a bit brighter than that and essentially I think maybe 10 people went to Atlanta and nearly all of those were the senior management so they were getting good financial deal salary wise to go. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of the young people just didn't go and it was no problem for them. Uh, they got jobs at, uh, uh, at university, uh, at CanMet, uh, at uh, um, uh, Atomic Energy and so on. So they didn't, they didn't have any difficulty getting jobs. Uh, so in fact, again, um, 
the intellectual knowledge base was essentially wiped, uh, greatly reduced anyway. And it made decisions like stopping continuous casting at a time when the technology of continuous casting was moving ahead, um, you know, with, with flex casters and high-speed twin roll casters and so on. Uh, massive changes in the technology. Uh, and that's the time that they decided to get out of the business. Anyway, <laughs> but I say business, you know, that's, that's, what they, that's what they pay the big bucks to do. Uh, they fortunately did not get out of automotive sheet. Uh, and that's another project that worked on for 30 years or 20 odd years anyway, optimizing automotive sheet. And it was an enormous technical struggle uh, to keep automotive sheet going because a few of us felt that transport, aluminum in aerospace, sure, aircraft, great. But there were huge opportunities in, in transportation, we felt. Uh, and getting the weight down in a vehicle uh, made eminent sense from the, the consumer's point of view and uh, uh, the uh, automotive point of view and company point of view as well. But it was a hard sell. Uh, and um, we, while aluminum sheet has been in automotive for many, many years, uh, on a large tonnage project, uh, it took over 20 years to, to get to that stage. Uh, and but now, um, you know the the dominant alloys are essentially alkan alloys. They, they mm -hmm. are, both in the Almag and the two thousand series, the six thousand series. I mean, various alcor and so on of an alloy. They call it a little bit different. They tweaked it to get whatever. But uh, but essentially, uh, uh, it's alkan alloys are the predominant alloys, and the predominant understanding of how to form these things and so on. But the the if you want to talk about that. Uh, I don't know if you're going to talk to him, but Mike Wheeler is the person mm -hmm. to talk to. And uh, he did a yeoman, yeoman's job uh, keeping automotive sheet alive within our cam. When a lot of people are, what do we want to get? We got all this metal going into the cam. How are we going to recycle these? Blah, blah, blah. There's always <laughs> enormous reasons for why you don't do something, right? Anyway, uh, but um, it led to very good understanding of what made what makes 6000 series particularly medium strength 6000 series alloys tick and so on and today we can quantify pretty well most of the behavior of the of the 6000 series alloys not that a lot of that's in the literature but the, well now it may be forgotten but anyway <laughs> there are still a few of us around who can do that uh, but um, so that was a that was a big effort, uh, uh, and um, it it, uh, it took up many many years to bring that to fruition, and led to to you know improved adhesives, improved loop. The the, the fallout from that program uh, in different ways that were then applicable to other activities of the company. Uh, can, is almost immeasurable, really, and and often managers managing science is very difficult because it's it can be expensive, it's difficult to do. You need bright people to to do it, and it's risky. And at the end of the day, you cannot. It's not like building a house. You can't say, okay, we're going to start today and six months down the road we're going to have a house. That's not how science works. Uh, uh, so it's very difficult for people to manage uh, science because it really depends on on groups of individuals doing a whole variety of things and to a manager it may look totally disconnected, disconnected from what they see as what the objectives are. But almost every project that I've worked on when we've got a good understanding of what's going on and whatever, it's had fallout in other areas. And also, often, when you have something like automotive sheet, a lot of what we did in terms of the processing of automotive sheet, optimum processing of automotive sheet, we learned from stuff that people had done on extrusions 20 years before, right? So 
it, it's a very div diverse activity and there are a lot of, of uh, uh, things that come off of it that um, if you're planning or whatever you would never anticipate really uh, and but you need bright people to identify and say geez you know why don't we do that to this and um, you need talented people you need people who are prepared to go through the grain work and understand what's going on that's not the mentality today I'm afraid but anyway, it used to be yes yeah, so, uh, so what are your thoughts on the metallurgical industry today well You have to appreciate that I'm getting on now. Uh, so my my perspective is probably very wrong and very different. But it it seems to me that physical metallurgy has never been in worse shape in Canada. When I came to Canada, Canada was a powerhouse of physical metallurgy really. Not only did we have several really good labs, where, you know, you had McMassey, had Toronto, had McGill, uh, uh, and uh, uh, West you had Alberta and UBC, uh, all doing very, very good physical metallurgy stuff. But in addition to that, and the key thing was in addition to that, you had corporate and government labs that were doing really good stuff. I mean at NRC you had people like Brzezinski, a world authority on defamation and work hardening and his group second to, to none. Uh, you know you, you had uh, the the Alcan uh, operations, you had Inco, uh, you had Sheridan Park, you had Stelco. These were all research labs some better than others, but they were all active in, in research and supporting research as it means physical metallurgy and all uh, uh, supporting activities at, at universities and in their own facilities and, and had people who, you need people in industry who can talk to people sensibly and at pretty well an equivalent level to the university people or the government people and now, name one physical metallurgy lab in industry in Canada. I can't name one. There may be one somewhere, but I can't name one. They've all gone, uh, and it you know it's it's a result of of uh, uh, corporations taking over um, who um, really don't have that mindset. And I mean, when Rio Tinto or whoever takes over and out, they're not interested in Canada. They're interested in the bottom line for their company. I mean, and you look at Canada, at Alcan now, I don't know, does it have 1,500 workers as part of Rio Tinto? I doubt it. Uh, you know, and does Rio Tinto do any research? Maybe in the smelter side of things, because it's a, con you know, it, it, it's a, a basically a large tonnage commodity company uh, but um, does it do um, it may do innovative research I suppose in smelters or whatever I mean I guess it does but I uh, but in terms of physical metallurgy there's nothing really I mean uh, and even Corp, you know the NRC lab is a yeah, uh, still very good people there, but geez, it's a, it's tiny in comparison with what it was. Uh, can met struggles on bravely, I guess, uh, but um, they, you need several elements for uh, a research activity to be viable, and. Um, we go, Canada has gone for uh, uh, in, uh, in overseas investment and so on and it's essentially wiped out the metal industry essentially so there are a couple of small companies you know but um, it's, uh, it's rather depressing I think really and we still have some very good people uh, in university but even the universities now uh, I, we, we have uh, Waterloo, uh, who's really outstanding group of people there. I mean, uh, we mentioned Mary Wells, but uh, uh, Mike Warswick was there, and uh, a whole bunch of people there were. Uh, Shazad Ismaili's there. A whole bunch of people there were very good. Um, so we have that 
essentially. Um, out in uh, UBC, we have Warren Poole, who came from McMaster, uh, and, his, and uh, Chad Slink, Sinclair and so on, too. World-class physical metallurgists. I don't know how they survive, really, to be honest with you. I mean, we always, uh, we, we uh, uh, through a couple of things, we managed to have a program on, on uh, uh, on aluminum scandium with, with Warren at UBC. And Warren and I and Dave Embry still do a little bit of science together when we can, or at least think about science together when we can. But uh, you've got UBC, you've got Waterloo. I really don't know what, uh, what Toronto does much these days. Uh, the big, and McMaster seems to me to be, uh, well, the, the light, the real, Lights in McMaster now retired. Dave Emery, Gary Purdy. Uh, well, Dave Wilkinson is still there, but now he's VP Research or something. Uh, so you know. Uh, so I, uh, I don't think there's much what I would call phys physical metal. At least physical metallurgy it interests me uh, at uh, at Mac going on these days. So there's, there's the odd individual doing something interesting. I mean, you look at, uh, I don't know what McGill is doing these days in physical metallurgy, but I mean, I, I review, I'll act as a reviewer for papers for Actomet and Metrans and whatever, and I don't see much of interesting fundamental stuff going on these days, other than, as I say, at, uh, uh, at Waterloo and UBC, but you know, it's, uh, it's sad. Yeah, what are you the way. proudest of? Eh? What are you the proudest of? Oh, I never think of being proud of anything. <laughs> I survived, I suppose. No, I, I think uh, I think I've brought along the uh, careers of a few few people who've done very well, uh, and I'm I'm proud of that really. Uh, and they're you know they're all over, and uh, uh, I think that that. that, that probably is, is uh, what's pleased me most really and I it's the science has always been important but the people are, are the important thing I guess everybody says that you know without a job what do you do well what do you miss well I miss the people well I guess it's generally said but the said but um, I think it's also true really so you know, it's, uh, but it's very sad to see the decline in metallurgy, physical metallurgy, uh, in Canada and, and to some extent worldwide. There are still a few places uh, in Europe uh, that are doing phys mat and, and there's a little bit of, I, sh I sh shouldn't, should say that, that, that uh, uh, Queen's ha uh, has a few people who are doing some, some nice stuff as well. Uh, Shig is now retired and Red Smith has passed on unfortunately and a couple of the other people there have passed on but uh, but there's a little you know but it's it, it's a small activity really and um, not traditional not what I would call physical metallurgy and and uh, 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 I don't do it now but I I, uh, I did have I was asked a couple of occasions to uh, interview prospective uh, students and uh, um, it's pretty disappointing really in, in terms of their they might be whizzes and microelectronic materials or whatever but they wouldn't understand a microstructure if it hit them in the teeth so I you know but uh, it's it's, pro it's probably all unfair uh, it's just that's my that's uh, my impression and I uh, appreciate that <laughs> but you know I, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, the, the disappointing thing is is uh, when you see the the corporations who had if you're a physical metallurgy and you're interested in research it's just really disappointing to to see the huge decline that's happened and it'll never recover no I don't think but there is you know there's still some interesting stuff going on in places an odd place in Europe and uh, and Japan certainly and I presume in China I don't know but uh, Anyway, is there anything else that you would like to tell me? That no, we de we've been depressed enough, haven't we? I think it's fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate. That's okay.